Hi, Mickey. Hey, Bob. How you doing? I'm doing okay. I'm wearing festive Christmas colors. I want credit for that. Good. You mean holiday colors, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, these are, um, these are actually Christmas colors. <laughs> no, Mickey, I'm sorry. Okay. There are no Christmas colors. They're holiday colors. And happy holidays to you. You sound stopped up. Uh, I am. Um, uh, I, either I'm, I'm sick or my house is poisoning me, but since everybody I know is sick, I take comfort in their suffering. So let's just assume I'm sick and I'll get better. Yeah, a kind of schadenfreude. It's a schadenfreude virus. Schadenf schadenfreude plus. Yeah. It's not just envy. There's a rational motive. Well, I admire your candor. And, you know, speaking of candor, Mickey, uh, the, I, I've heard that, that we have a new candid George Bush. Did you... Is, is this a widespread meme? Or, uh, it's, it's pretty widespread. I mean, John Dickerson sort of captured it on Slate. Uh, the, the, he didn't give it a name, unfortunately. Uh, the best thing to do is, I guess, just to call it the new candor. Uh, Bush admitting mistakes, Bush uh, reaching out to any war opponents, saying he understands why they disagree with him, uh, Bush saying he will listen to concerns and adjust accordingly. Uh, I think the federal government even took uh, some blame for Katrina last week. Uh, so it does seem to be a, a, a sort of big administration initiative, which Dickerson claims they started in the summer. Uh, that is, it's not just by accident. It's it's. It's, it's been slowly gaining momentum, unbeknownst to us? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's like, you know, it's like, uh, let's reposition the president or let's rebrand him. It's like a, it's like a yeah. big corporate adjustment. Yeah, well, D David Brooks affirmed, affirmed it, uh, so it must be, at the very least, an official talking point and, and maybe true. I don't know. But uh, I have, uh, I, I I, I argue that, in at least some senses, the new Bush, who was supposedly on display over the last four or five days, is uh, still not being completely candid when it comes to the causes and consequences of the war. I have Exhibit A and B. Which would you like to hear first? Uh, why don't we start with A? Okay, I will. Um, his uh, interview with, with uh, Jim Lehrer on Friday night. Right. So you don't think going into Iraq affected our ability to get Osama bin Laden no. and eliminate Al-Qaeda. Not at all. As a matter of fact, Al-Qaeda has gone into Iraq to fight us. Um, do, you see, do you see anything misleading about that? Uh, well, just only that, that, that there are some, uh, some resource constraints, probably, and we can't throw everything we got at Osama, but since that probably wouldn't be enough anyway, I, I don't find what he said objectionable. I would go further, Mickey. Okay. He says Al-Qaeda has now gone into Iraq as if, aha, they've fallen into our trap. We've lured them in, and now we can finish them off. Now, it's true that there is something called Al-Qaeda in Iraq. It's Al-Qaeda of Mesopotamia, run by Zarqawi. Right. But that's not the, that's not the Al-Qaeda that attacked us. In fact, he was not affiliated with Al-Qaeda when they attacked us. He was already in the vicinity of Iraq, going in and out of Iraq, but at that point... Uh, he was a terrorist who, who was uh, at, at least as, as bent on thwarting Jordan as he was on thwarting uh, the U.S. So what's really happened, it was only after we invaded that he saw the opportunity and, and, and the incentive to ally himself with al-Qaeda and adopt their name. So basically the war has just extended the al-Qaeda brand, the al-Qaeda franchise. It's not as if it's drawn all these people who, I mean, so far as we know, who, who you know, from, from uh, the hills of, of Pakistan where, you know, uh, where, where OBL is no, into I, Iraq, and it's just kind of fundamentally misleading. I agree, but there, it, there also might be communications between Zarqawi and Zawahiri and Osama that we can oh, intercept. Oh, I think communications, but when Bush says, says not only has it not affected our ability to get uh, Osama in line, as a matter of fact, Al-Qaeda has gone into Iraq to fight us. In that context, what he's clearly saying is, look, we're in better shape than ever to finish them off, because now they're in Iraq. No, no, the guys... The guys we were supposed to finish off to begin with are not in Iraq. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have helped uh, al-Qaeda grow. We've helped the brand grow. And it's, it's a general example of, uh, of things Bush has done to take previously disparate terrorist groups, some of which did not have uh, their, their primary aim, the, the destruction of, of American interests, and we've turned them into well, a more unified, more cohesive, more uniformly anti-American right. well, movement. Well, I would, I would say that, that 
you fit on a case where Bush isn't being completely candid. I mean, one thing Dickerson says in his piece is that in private, Bush really is much more subtle than he seems to be in public. In other words, he'll, uh, he'll ad- not setting the bar very he'll, high. He'll, but he'll admit that you know maybe our troops are doing uh, are provoking uh, insurgency as well as putting you know putting it down. Uh, and 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 this may be a case where uh, it probably is the case where his surface justification is BS. But he actually has a real justification that, that's more substantial. And you're right; uh, he's not being candid when he when he advances the the BS uh, justification. I, I would say he's being out and out deceptive in trying to portray the presence of quote Al Qaeda in Iraq. It, it, as it would be worse if he wasn't being deceptive and if he really believed it. Uh, I, th- that, I think that, he is being deceptive. Would, well, actually, I don't know because then then it, w- then it would mean he wasn't being dishonest. Okay, on to Exhibit B. Um, in a speech, this is a speech, not an impromptu utterance. Right. He says, yet it was right to remove Saddam Hussein from power. He was given an ultimatum, and he made his choice for war. Now, Mickey, do you recall an ultimatum with which he failed to comply, which noncompliance led to the war? Uh, I think there were some... There were some not compliance around the margins of some of the UN resolutions, yes. I think you've got to push it pretty far off to the margins. What basically happened is we said, look, we mean business. You better tell us what, what uh, weapons of mass destruction you have. He said, hey, I don't have any. We said, we don't believe you. UN inspectors are coming in. He said, okay, bring them in. Then there were some, then there were some minor you know, cases at first, at the beginning, where like the UN inspectors were forced to cool their heels for a few hours before they opened up some facility. But as time wore on, the compliance came, became more complete, more efficient. When, when the UN inspectors found uh, a few rockets, a few missiles that were like three feet over the specs that had been set by some UN resolution, they said, you have to destroy them. He started destroying them. I mean, he was in fundamental compliance and and this is there's been this great memory lapse everyone everyone goes around saying well then why didn't he in fact bush uh in in 03 after the invasion said this impromptu and we gave him the chance to allow the inspectors in and he wouldn't let them in now he took so much heat for that blatant misstatement that there's no way this the, the the passage in his speech was crafted uh, in kind of ignorance of what actually happened, I would say. And I would say this, what he said, he was given an ultimatum and he made his choice for war is an out-and-out, out, I'm sorry, uh, a lie. I don't Joe, see any other way to put it. Uh, because uh, he was doing everything we were asking at the end, and we didn't even bother to say, wait, wait, this is, you've got to do A, B, and C further or it will invade, because Bush didn't want to give him the chance. Two, point, he, two points. Uh, first, in the, in the larger picture of things, Saddam is a special case. He committed transborder aggression. The UN waged war on him legitimately. Uh, it imposed a series of restrictions, so he was sort of on probation, and he definitely violated that probation at some some point along the line. He had violated uh, in, in, in a way that would, early, would, but those weren't ultimatums, Mickey. Okay, those, I'm those, not saying the speech. Fall in the I'm not saying the speech was honest. I'm just saying that 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 you you could justify the war in a way that wouldn't apply to other nations. And the second thing is he was trying to maintain some ambiguity about his weapons of mass destruction, in part to intimidate his neighbors. And, and we call this bluff. And That's why he finally let, let the inspectors in, only under threat of force, because he did want to maintain the ambiguity, which perfectly explains why he was playing cat and mouse earlier. But, no, but, the, I, but when Bush says he was given an ultimatum and he made his choice for war, that is fundamentally dishonest, but, because the only thing that can really be called an ultimatum he finally caved Again, in on I urge you, and we invaded him. Anyway. I, I urge you to not to condemn Bush for the BS, but to judge Bush for the real rationale for the war, which was to implant democracy in the Middle East, blah, 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 blah. No, 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 that's We've not been what over we're discussing. I'm asking, was this an honest speech? Would you say this is an honest would, passage of this speech? I would speech? say he gets an in, definitely gets an incomplete for candor, but it's a step in the right direction. Incomplete. My, my point is, why didn't he do this months ago? I mean, why does it take... Mickey, when I'm standing before the pearly gates, I hope you're the one passing judgment on me, buddy. When... Why why does it take a big sort of corporate brand readjustment to be candid? I mean, it should take 10 minutes. You know, he goes out and he's candid. Uh, yeah, I don't and quite it should un- be I, actual candor. And it would have helped him if he'd started, it's supposedly, according to Dickerson, this, this candor initiative was hatched in the summer. Well, if he'd started in the summer, he'd be in a lot better shape now than starting it in, in November or December when he'd already sunk to 39% approval rating in the polls. So I, I don't quite under, you know I don't quite understand why the White House can't be a little more nimble 
And the other point Dickerson makes is that Cheney didn't get the message. Cheney is still spouting complete uh, party line. Uh, you know, Iraq is going fine. There are no problems when soldiers in Iraq asked him the tough questions. Yes, but ironically, that's not as fundamentally dishonest as the stuff Bush is saying. These are questions of fact, and he's just not telling. He's just not telling the truth. But well, I'm, I, I don't want to be a reflexive Bush supporter here. I, I, uh, I'm trying I, I, to. I will, I will not defend his misstatements of fact. I'm trying to provoke you into playing that role. Uh, I know it's it's good for ratings, takes, but but I won't. It takes a lot of work. Um, so so let's so now that we agree on everything there. Should I ring the bell? Are we still doing this bell? Yeah. Thing? Okay. Ring it. Iraq. We're going to... Oh, we already were talking about Iraq. We're going to continue in a new vein. I have a question. Yes. Well, okay, so the elections went as well as anybody could hope. Right. We now, think. Now, what? We think. I mean... We think. Well, not in terms of outcome. I mean just just the conduct of the elections. Well, not, in terms of outcome, there are some uh, disturbing signs on the horizon. Very disturbing signs. The dream scenario had been the secular... Uh, a secular, even call Shiite Sunni coalition that wields the balance of power. The New York Times, I guess, among others, reports that it's looking increasingly like uh, the Shiite religious parties did much better than the uh, than the secular. Well, if you and if you read uh, Iraq, the model, the blog, and the, and the blog cited in Pajamas Media, all the secular bloggers are are very dispirited by how few secular votes there were. Uh, you know, and there was this incredible sentence in the New York Times where basically they said, we thought we'd invented a country with a large secular middle class, but it turns out it doesn't exist. Um, well, so, it, yes. may, it may have been a little more secular then, actually. I mean, we, we've had enough time to influence the, the tenor of, of thought there. Also, this, our secular guy, the Alawi, was, was uh, you know, corrupt and unpopular, so he's not yeah. exactly a good horse to have in the, in the fight. True. Now, is it, is it the case that it's both on the Sunni side and the, I mean, it, it, on the Shiite side and the Sunni side that the secular parties seem clearly to be? Uh, I, I don't know. That's a very good question. Uh, it, well, it, the other question is, which is better on the Sunni side? If you grant that the religious Shiites win, are there are there prospects for coalition, a, a, a trans ethnic coalition or trans uh, sectarian coalition or something? Uh, are they better with? Uh, with religious Sunnis or with with secular Sunnis? I assume with secular Sunnis. I mean, don't, aren't the religions in opposition? They, they, they are quite a bit, although on the other hand, sometimes when religion, in America, when people of very vastly different religious backgrounds face secular people, they all of a sudden like each other. But you're probably right. I mean, this is a, this is a question that would, that would require Juan Cole-level uh, Understanding or familiarity with these cultures. I haven't um, checked in with Juan Cole today. I should have. I, I, the last time I checked, he wasn't he wasn't addressing this. But uh, but oh, uh, Iraq, the model is really only concerned with the Shiites, uh, and and their dominance of, of Shiite communities and the absence of a, a secular Shiite uh, voting bloc. Uh huh. Uh, now they're interested there, but there are weird things going on. I mean, Iraq, the model had an update where all of a sudden the election commission had lopped 100,000 votes off the the religious Shiite voting bloc, and it, it it almost looks like there's like a political negotiation going on in terms of counting the votes and adjusting the vote totals. It, it's it's actually quite suspicious making. Uh, oh, well, I, why yeah, they, well, even, they, just... they weren't even supposed to announce results. Why are they announcing results now? They weren't supposed to announce them for two weeks. It's, no, these elections were not regulated in the sense that American elections were, I think. I mean, just no way it could be as comprehensive and clean. Well, we don't trust our elections either, of course. But True. Uh, I do, more or less. Uh, but um, it, it's, um, it all reinforces my, my point, which is that these people are elected now for four-year terms. That's just way too long. Uh, you know, we want another election in two years. Uh, the, 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 just because this one didn't produce the right result? Well, sh well, sure, but also things move fast. Suppose the Iraqi population gets disgusted with the, sh the religious parties and wants to go secular. They can't do it. Uh, it, it just seems in a fast-changing sort yeah. of quasi-revolutionary you, you situation. You could argue, yes, in a fluid situation like that, you want a faster feedback cycle. Yes, exactly. So whoever designed this constitution made a big mistake there. And it also puts incredible pressure on our ambassador, Mr. Khalilzad, to, to sort of somehow concoct some sort of uh, you know, trans-sect government, despite the fact that the voters themselves seem to be polarized. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if, if, suppose, what if he got blown up in a car bomb? We're totally sunk. 
Yeah, he's apparently pretty effective. Yeah. Um, well, that those are my questions on Iraq. Okay, well, that, that I think uh, I think that's the situation. Yeah. Uh, it seems grim at the moment. Well, I wouldn't go that. I mean, I'm not sure I'd go that. I okay. mean, I mean. Seems grim for those of us who hope for a, a, a large secular showing. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I, I'm not. That, I'm not that upset by the prospect of a religious government. I am upset by the prospect of a civil war. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's. I mean, w I guess I don't know whether this ends the 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 hoped for prospect of the foreign jihadists getting squeezed out by the by the indigenous Sunni insurgency. Um, it seems to me if that happens, there's still it's things are still much more hopeful than they were a couple you, months ago. You don't know uh, on Iraq the model the the Sunnis are making very warlike noises because they're. They're not quite learning the lesson that they're only 20% of the population. They're, they're claiming voter fraud, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, you don't know if that is just sort of, you know, guerrilla dust, if that's just sort of the standard complaints everybody makes after an election, or if they really mean that they're going to abandon the electoral process. And well, they're going to be pulling out tougher weapons than that. I mean, the best-case scenario, it seems to me, is that some of the Sunnis in the legislature are an extension of the insurgency. And the insurgency uses violence to push the agenda being pushed in the legislature. I think that's the hopeful scenario. That's the only way this thing gets gets solved. Um, so you know, yeah, it's it's, it's going to be rough. I'm still troubled by that scenario because it hasn't really brought peace in Northern Ireland, has it? No. I mean, and, then, Jerry and then another interesting case is the Palestinians. Hamas has been doing well in elections there, um, and uh, it's a strange situation where, in a certain sense. That's that's the only hope because if the negotiators don't control the violence, why negotiate? That was the problem with well, because saying, "Well, I can't control well, this stuff." Well, then what's the, the point? The of alternative problem? model is the mass of the Sunni population say, "Hey, elections are the way to go," and they start phoning in to the authorities the location of the terrorists, and they go and arrest them. Uh, and it's not that they have a representative in the legislature, yeah, but, but the, it's the that the majority the of the Sunni people, the sea in which they swim, turns against them. Yeah, but the problem is the Sunnis are such a small percentage of the population, and they're accustomed to such a privileged position that to get anything like what they expect to get, it's going to take more than the ordinary workings of the legislature. It, it, you know, it is going to take some uh, external force like organized violence uh, to, to, to get the kind of deal that, that they want. And yet, of course, the organized violence does threaten to spiral out of control. This is the problem. And, and it was always my my concern about the elections was that it's fine, they go well, but then at the, at the end, the Sunnis still have only 15, 20 percent, and that's not the world they're accustomed to. Well, they could team up with the Kurds. That was the idea. Yeah, but you know, the Kurds, it seems to me, they just would just as soon opt out of the whole thing. Uh, like, uh, if we do want to give Sunnis sort of more power than they deserve... Uh, we have the military power to do that sort of more than, you know, I mean, I guess the preferable means would be that we tell the Shiites, look, you have to give them more power. Oh, I thought you were going to say we should arm the insurgency, which would be a novel approach. That would be. We have been known to sell arms to two sides of the same conflict, but I think this would be going too far. Maybe. I see an op-ed. I'm going to, sh I shoot down that suggestion. I see, I see an op-ed piece in that already. I think it's brilliantly contrarian. Yeah. Uh, um, okay. Okay, enough of that. I have a wire type tapping question. Okay. Uh, you 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 steered me to this. Uh, you know, this is a wire tapping scandal. Right. That, that, that Bush is uh, is waist deep in, even as we right. speak. Uh, you steered me to this piece on the Eugene Volok site, written by someone other than him. Written by Oren Kerr. It's a very good piece. It's the go-to blog of the day. You say that like as someone who's actually read it. I have read the whole Oren Kerr piece. I haven't read the 118 pages of comments. Oh, okay. uh, but, uh, well, well, would you go do that? It, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll go have a drink. It was also, do I think it was, uh, Dahlia Lithwick also said it was a good piece, so I trust her. She knows more than I do. Pl okay. Although it's very tentative. It doesn't reach any definite conclusions. Well, here's what the first, its own first paragraph summary was. I got all the way to nearly the end of the first paragraph, and here's what I learned, and I want you to explain it to me. His tentative conclusion was what Bush did was constitutional, but it did violate this uh, law, what's the law called? The, the FISA law. FISA law. Um, and what I want to know is what's the relationship between those two? I mean, presumably he's not saying the fact that it's constitutional nullifies the illegality uh, of violating an act, right? He doesn't mean 
He's not affirming it at that level, right? In other words, it's possible to do something that is constitutional but illegal. Right. And he's, and, saying, and that he's, saying, that's, and he's saying that's what Bush has done. Yes. Well, well, that seems to be a big story because this is not exactly a bleeding heart liberal website. It's a, it's a thorough analysis. Uh, and the guy is saying Bush did something illegal. Now, we know what we've done to some right. past presidents who thought we're doing illegal co things. A, a, a couple of points. It, it's, first, it's, it's a pretty gray area. Second, uh, conservatives who say, uh, uh, yes, it's illegal, you could say, and which I think is the case, is that the law doesn't fit, the law is obsolete and should be amended. Uh, the, the, the niceties of probable cause that are enshrined in this law, although they're watered down somewhat, don't fit the, the terrorist situation where you basically want to run about, you know, 100,000 phone calls through a computer and figure out which ones are terrorists. There's no probable cause for any one of those, but you still want to do it. So uh, the, the sort of overblown, uh, the overblown notions of privacy combined with the, the, the sort of archaic circumstances in which the law was written produced a law that was, isn't suited to the circumstances. I agree they should just be explicit and amended. The third point mm -hmm. is that I thought Kerr found actually a loophole where it might have been legal, uh, the, which he sort of poo-poos, but it seemed more powerful to me, the, 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 so, the so-called border search exemption. In other words, we have broad powers to search things coming into, coming into the country, and these were only wiretaps on call, international calls, not domestic, you know, Arkansas to Florida calls, and if if there is this exception to the Fourth Amendment that lets uh, you do border searches, the law itself says it doesn't apply where the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply. So but, by definition, Nikki, if, if you pursue the law that analogy, apply. if you pursue that analogy, in addition to searching things that were coming into the country, in other words, whatever the foreigners were saying to the Americans, right. They were searching things that were going out of the country. Right. That was also uh, at the border. It was leaving the border as supposed to come in. Yeah. Uh, I, it, it's just a, it's a technical legal loophole that it seems to me he it's hit It's so on. technical. I mean, comparing, I don't know. That, that, that is, that is uh, yeah, technical is I'm, the I'm word. Not, I, would, not, technical, I, I would say, no, it's more than technical. It's not clearly, it, it doesn't clearly technically vindicate him. It takes an imaginative reading of this to turn it into a technical loophole is what I'd say. But, um, but, but but the point is that it, it, it lets him slide around the illegality argument uh, colorably, which uh, is something he desperately okay, needs at the moment. Okay, but he himself, again, the non-liberal, smart, well-informed person who wrote this thing, did not himself think that loophole was ultimately right. Valid. There are a lot of conservatives who think Bush broke the law. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, well, it's, that, it's, this and, is and he's just one of them. This is interesting, because it's funny. I was just at a party a week ago where someone said, why can't we impeach Bush? And I explained that he hadn't done anything impeachable. Lo and behold, he, he commits a crime. And, and, and you may be right that this thing needs to be amended, but unless I'm wrong, that would not affect the legality of anything Bush has done in the past, right? Right, although it's, you know, it's, it, it, the, the courts just don't want to deal with this claim of inherent authority, so I do not think he's going to be impeached over this. Uh, plus, Well, let's start the rumor anyway. What do you say? <laughs> okay. Um, well, I have a guy who owns the impeach, impeachbush.com website, which he's looking to sell for millions of dollars. So, uh, I think the price has just gone up. Um, okay. Uh, the, I have one more okay. thing on this. It, it is you know, there's been a lot of uh, questions raised again, not just by liberals, but but by the kind of David Brooks's and George Wills of the world uh, about why. Not only questioning whether what he was doing was valid, which certainly uh, George Will was, was vehement in questioning, but um, why kind of he doesn't seem to have anticipated how explosive this would be. They didn't, they didn't have their talking points ready when it was revealed. And, and in his, his, his uh, press conference, he seemed quite genuinely uh, indignant that, that anyone should question his right to do this. The, the fact that we're discussing this program is uh, helping the enemy. Uh, my explanation of, of this kind of indignation, uh, I, as you know, I'm inclined to find explanations of Bush's behavior that aren't flattering, uh, is that it's another example of Bush's inability to put himself in the shoes of people in very different circumstances from his. Uh, you know, he, I just don't think he has the kind of moral imagination it takes to do that. And in, and in this case, you know, j just in other words, Suppose you're not the president who is sure he's right. 
Suppose you're an American citizen who makes phone calls to Canada, to Britain, and, and, and thinks, wait a second, he's saying that without a court order, if he just doesn't like me or something, he can choose to, to, to listen into my conversations? Now, that's a kind of a natural reaction. Anybody should understand that. I think Bush is really bad at understanding perspectives different from his. I think it's gotten him into trouble again and again. And, and I think it's part of what uh, one uh, the reason that, that the post-war situation was such a mess in Iraq. I don't think he or anybody with power in his administration said, okay, now suppose you're an Iraqi and a foreign power invades. What would you need to see to be reassured that this was all okay? And what would happen if you were not reassured? Although he said, I would like to be occupied either, so he... At least. Oh, he says that now. No, he said. I don't it, he think, said. It, I don't think he, he said thought it. it he said it very early on. The well, yeah, when they started showing that we had not planned the, adequately. I, I think if you are so seriously pursuing terrorists, you get very frustrated in a very self-righteous way about uh, all the you know Patrick Leahy like inhibitions that are put in your way, uh, and and and, uh, and and he was reflecting that righteous indignation. I agree. It's a, it's a failure of the imagination. On the other hand. I think all this, if I call England, I don't have any expectation of privacy. If, if you put yourself in my shoes, you wouldn't be outraged at all. I think all these privacy concerns are way overblown. Here we are having a, a, what is in essence a phone conversation. We're broadcasting it to the whole world. Uh, that's the way the world is going. The world is going, Wait, now this the is world is going in the direction say, of less privacy. <laughs> and and Mickey, now, privacy, the, the, is, as, as you argued in your book, Non-Zero, is going to have to give way. Mickey, the planning behind Blogging Heads TV may not have been as systematic in retrospect as would have been ideal, but I don't think we can compare this to a phone call between two people. Uh, you know, we, we know that this is we know that this is publicly accessible. I understand, but, I, but, but but expectations of privacy, legitimate expectations of privacy, are diminishing rapidly in an era of terrorism. And, Some people and, would say that's all the more reason to, to be vigilant. I would say that. I just said it. The other, but the problem is if we if we make it explicit. In other words. If we, if we pass a law saying they can run every transatlantic phone call through the echelon computers and figure out who's a terrorist, then the terrorists know that. Uh, so I think that's the other dilemma Bush was wrestling with. Yeah, but I assume the terrorists, those guys aren't used to civil liberties. I think they now assume, you know, anything they say is fair game. Oh, I think they, they, they know exactly what the civil liberties are, and they take advantage of, of every time they think something's protected. And if they think mm -hmm. something's unprotected, they switch, uh, switch their means of communication. Well, I'll let you have the last word on that if you'll ring the uh, bell. Okay. Uh, the um, this this New York Times. Uh, Speaking of privacy. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent no, segue. Thank you. This New York Times story that that was number one on their most emailed list forever and may still be about this uh, boy who, and they're telling, was kind of lured into the world of online porn, beginning when he was young, like thirteen or something. Right. Um. That is much discussed. I mean, I'll say this much for him. Uh, at least he had a revenue model, which <laughs> right. more than we can say. Uh, I thought maybe one thing we could try is telling people that we will take our shirts off if they don't send us money. Um, might work, anyway. In, in, in his case, he started by taking off his shirt for money. Uh, and ended up doing everything in the book. He got addicted to drugs, and that was apparently exploited by uh, by people who wanted to to use him. Um, did this did this freaked everybody out? Did it freak you out? You're, you're the t it would be like you to say no. Why why did it freak everybody out? Okay, <laughs> because for one thing, a lot of them have uh, have 13 year old kids. Right. Okay. Um, but uh, I, I gotta say, I mean, it it, it, it you know one. One question people ask is, have things changed more in the last 30 years than in the previous 30 years, and blah, blah, blah. And, and I've got to say, this really convinced me that things have changed much more between my childhood and now than they had between my father's childhood and when he was my age, which was when I was about 10 or 11. Um, you know, in his day, they had... They had Phones and radios. I don't think he had those in his house, actually, but they they existed. And then and then they threw in TV, and that was about it. You know, I mean, this is a fundamentally different world when you think about the implications of this, because remember, you know, when you so in principle, anyone can become this sort of entrepreneur. Now you may say most people wouldn't want to. A lot of people would be shamed into not doing. But one thing to remember is they can do this in effect anonymously because if you look at the kinds of people who are willing to pay for this and they will be overwhelmingly male whether they're heterosexual or homosexual right. as is the pornography market generally 
for reasons that Darwinians understand, um, they're not they're not by and large interested in looking at the face anyway. You know, right? You can put on a mask and sell this stuff. Uh, so this is actually something that I think uh, could become more widespread than I had appreciated before I before I read the story. And that's just kind of a weird world. I'm sorry. Uh, it's it's. And it's not one I'm happy with. It's, it, it, it's certainly when they're, you know, teenagers doing it, but, but even beyond that, it's a little... If you put on a mask, isn't there less harm? I guess it's still pretty bad. Uh, well, less... There, 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 there's some forms of harm that can't then befall yeah, the kid. Yeah, but, you know, gross, I, yeah. I mean, it seems to me that one of the challenges of being human uh, is the kind of... Uh, raise the ratio uh, uh, of cerebral and high-minded motivations to base animal ones, and I'm, I'm just not sure the technology is doing that here. Uh, I agree, uh, but I, you know, why can't you just tell your kids to avoid webcams the way they avoid strangers and invite them into cars? You can, but, but, but the thing is, it's hard to control this aspect of their lives, and, and that's one thing that's fundamentally change is it's hard this is what scares parents it's harder and harder to know kind of what right. channel their kids are on so to speak right. what well, um well, so what, one of the things i've always that troubles me about all, uh this child porn uh fear is that in this is a case where we're telling people who have this impulse to basically cram it and suppress it and not giving them any legitimate outlet for it and i wonder if that's the best strategy the, the two this is the great debate is whether Indulging kind of animal impulses kind of exhaust them so that you won't be indulging them elsewhere, right. you know, the kind of dry discharge hypothesis, right. or whether, in fact, it reinforces them and makes you hungrier and hungrier, and whether you're not then likely to exercise that hunger in various other contexts as well. I tend to believe that the latter model is, is more correct. You know, when Jaron Lanier, who coined the term virtual reality, argued that it was going to be a wonderful technology because people would, would go in and they would... They would, they would, you know, they, they would discharge their violent impulses in this virtual world and not use them in a real world. I think that's 100% nonsense. Have violent video violent, games violent, violent, to more discharging, violent? Vi getting gratification for being violent is addictive, as is gratification generally. But I'm, I'm sort of, a, I've always believed that, but I'm surprised at the extent to which these incredibly violent video games have not spawned a wave of juvenile violence. Well, Columbine, those guys were playing them. Yeah, Columbines true. didn't happen at all in the earlier era in which you and I grew up, okay? They're not happening with tremendous frequency, but weirder things are happening. They're still happening with less frequency than you than the incredible prevalence of violent video games. Well, the ratio may be low, but yeah. But there you go. Okay, well, I defer... Do we have time for one super quick thing? I defer to you, yes. i got to ring the bell, though. Okay. Okay. I didn't hear the bell. I, I rang it. Oh. Uh, okay. This you and Frank Rich thing. Yes. Now, you predicted that Brokeback Bro Broke Mountain would be a commercial flop. Yes, a, dis you further, a disappointment, not a total bomb, but a disappointment. Oh, we're already repositioning, yeah, are we? He, he, you further suggested that, that Frank Rich might write uh, the inevitable column bemoaning its, its commercial failure and blaming it on, on rampant uh, homophobia in America. Yes. As if to prove you wrong, and we'll get back to that in a second, Frank Rich wrote a column saying the early signs are that this would be a commercial success, and it just goes to show you homophobia isn't rampant in right. America, aside from a few yahoos. Right. Two things. One, I think you should quantify your prediction. Are you, what, what is the most you think it will gross? Fifty million, seventy-five million. Uh, secondly, do you think it's possible that Frank Rich actually was replying to you? It was almost too good to be true how direct uh, a refutation of you this column was. Uh, I do think there's, he still has some wiggle room to, after, if it flops, to then switch and, 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 and engage in some sort of blame-placing. America is more homophobic than I thought, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I agree, it, was, it, it contradicted what I predicted. Uh, I don't know if he reads me. I mean, he was my tutor at, the, at my college paper. Oh, uh, and he's a nice guy, down. but I don't know if he if that means he reads me or not. Because uh, it seems to me one of the one of the problems with being as massively influential as you are is that everything you say influences world events, and that, so making predictions you run into this Heisenberg uncertainty problem. Well, don't yeah, you? but that way lies megalomania. You you begin to think you're like the Tony Curtis character in Winter Kills who controls the whole world from his flat in Brooklyn. Uh, 
No, it's not true. You, so the, I would just call you the Walter Littman of the blogosphere and vlogosphere. I, I, and leave every it Every time I've thought I've had an influence, it turns out it, to be exaggerated. So I assume that, that Rich just went a different way. Uh, okay, well, what about this quantification well, issue? It's a good, we'll know in January whether it's a flop or not. My, I was going to say, let's take the English patient as a benchmark. If it, if it doesn't do 80% of what the English patient did, uh, then I would say it's a flop. Do we know what that was? Uh, no. But I can we, find we will out. get one of our staffers on that, though. I can we? find out. It's it's somewhere. I think it's somewhere around forty million. Okay. But uh, but, that, but uh, you know people people all across America know more about the box office. So if it does fifty million, you you will rend your garments. I think if it does fifty million, I'm um, then I will be wrong. Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay. okay. Sign on. See ya.